Great. So, um, Marion gave a, a really comprehensive overview of the power that major corporations have in influencing what it is that we eat. But, but she was talking from, from a global perspective, but also very much from a US perspective. Now, Jess, you, you do a lot of work in some of the very poorest parts of the world. And I, I suppose my question to you to kick things off is, how far do these major corporations actually have any influence on people's consumption patterns there? And, and if not, what are the other influences on their consumption? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that their influence and reach is vast. I work in northern Kenya on the border of Somalia. You can still buy a Coca-Cola. Um, it's hard to get healthy food there, but you can buy a Coke. Um, and I think that the food environment, the place where consumers engage with this larger food system, is different depending on where you are. In really low-income countries, conflict, post-conflict countries, you have places that have very limited choices. Consumers have very little to choose from. And Linda Wei knows that very well in the African context. And then you, ha and that's usually the people that are going to bed hungry. You know, they're suffering from seasonal hunger, a lot of stunting, as Angus Deaton had talked about, uh, undernutrition. But you have this five billion that's sort of sitting in the middle. Um, they're transitioning from low to middle incomes. They're transitioning away from rural areas where there's less choice to urban environments where there's more choice. But there's still vast amounts of poverty there. And that's the group that we need to think about. What are their choices? How do they engage with the food environment? What are their priorities? Um, I work in Baltimore. I don't know if any of you know Baltimore. It's a city on its knees at the moment. A lot of racial tension. Um, a lot of inner city crime. We deal with guns, incarceration, issues like that. People shop at a liquor store behind bulletproof glass. That's your food environment. There's very limited choices in that food environment. So even though I tend to work more in low-income countries, we're seeing pockets of poverty and limited food environments, even in high-income countries. And I think we have to think about putting ourselves in those people's shoes. It's great to see these statistics, but we're sitting in Stockholm. We're in that sort of the one billion elite category where we have more power, we have more voice, but there's five billion that are sitting with very limited choices and not much voice. And probably their priorities are very different. They're not thinking about health and environment, they're thinking about cost, convenience, taste. And you see this everywhere. You go to Nepal, instant noodles are the most popular food item in Nepal because it's cheap, it's easy to cook, takes two minutes, and it actually tastes kind of good. So we need to start thinking about the food environment and how the consumers make choices. And it's not always the things that we want consumers to make. No. It's not always health and environment. That's much lower. Yeah. It has to fit into people's lives. When we think about Im impacts of issues, big drivers like climate change, population pressure, population density, as, as Angus Deaton had talked about, these are really going to influence how people make choices around their diets. So, I mean, you've talked a lot about this idea of transition, so moving from yeah. traditional to different food cultures. And I think, Eduardo, you're, you are, you, you're, Brazil kind of epitomizes that dilemma of having to deal, deal with, um, with this, this process of change. And, and you and the health ministry have really tried to take on board this idea that we don't just need a healthy diet a, B, C, this is what you should be eating, along the kind of US dietary model. But it is actually quite radical in the way that it talks about reconfiguring the way we eat. Do you want to say a bit about those guidelines? But also, um, you know, if I get a piece of paper that tells me how I should be eating, it's not as if I'm going to run off and do that. What, what else do you need to do to make that vision turn into reality? And what, what are you doing? Yeah, it's actually a, a big challenge that not only in Brazil, but most of the world, especially Latin America, we have transitioned very quickly from uh, malnutrition to overeating, obesity, chronic diseases, and 
that's what Sarah actually led to what we're working in terms of food guidelines, which is not making nutrition of nutrients, but making nutrition of foods and meals. And that is a huge twist because it affects the, how we view the food system or food systems, because uh, ult ultimately our food choices, uh, they bring everything behind it from the production, from the distribution, consumption, and even preparation of the, the food. So uh, we actually classify the foods differently based on uh, how much they're processed, and so from na natural, minimally processed foods to ultra-processed foods, which we call. And that brings a whole pattern of diets uh, along with it. So speaking from uh, a government point of view, it's a great, huge challenge of how governments can actually change the system, not only in terms of the health outcomes, but also in terms of the environment, and in terms of social aspects. And that's what we are actually working, because from the government point of view, we have to work on promoting healthy settings, of course. Uh, but we also have to affect somehow regulating the system, of course, and that comes to the policies of, of taxation, uh, of subsidizing healthy foods, and uh, improving access to healthy foods to have a healthy environment, but also to protect some specific environments, as schools, for instance, and other ones. But also how to educate populations uh, so they can make the right choices, but based on foods, because that's what uh, we found out, uh, because the, the guidelines although it's radical, but it's very uh, close to reality because it was based on the actual diet of the population of Brazil, and it could actually be fitted to other contexts uh, if you take into account what the healthier part of the population are consuming. So you can make that in terms of food and try to address the whole environment in, in that meaning. So you can uh, work on production, on supply, and, and have the whole uh, opportunity for uh, consumers to be informed, but also to know where the food comes from, how it's made, and make the right decisions based on, on all this environment. But so, I mean, there's a, a growing emphasis on the importance of the sort of socioeconomic structures that frame and influence our consumption patterns. Um, but I suppose that you could, that almost takes the individual out of the equation and says, the individual has absolutely no control on what it is they eat. And I think that's probably oversimplifying the, the issue. Um, but if you were going to take the individual down a stage to the kind of the genetic and the biological level. Liz, do you, do you think there is any um, validity in the idea that we're, we're sort of programmed to want to eat these high fat, high sugar, high salt foods that, that the food industry has such an apparently easy job of selling us? And, and if, if the, the, the corporate might of the food industry were to reorientate itself towards um, promoting those that diversity of fruits and vegetables that I know that you're particularly interested in. Do you think there will be any? Do you think they'd have any chance of success? Well, I think you've touched on different things. Uh, the industry certainly makes use of the fact that humans, particularly humans under various kinds of stresses, and that is very much a situation in modern kinds of um, settings, do have a very well-founded physiological response, which is to get some high energy, you know, high fat food really quickly. And in, in situations of chronic severe stress, that then is a recipe for a desire for these kinds of foods. And furthermore, it sets up, you know, reward patterns in the brain, which almost like classic addiction to drugs plays into these things. So there's a physiology there. But on the other hand, this is not, not inevitable because um, there's, uh, I, I think education and knowledge about these kinds of patterns give people a certain empowerment to realize what's going on. And I'm very struck by um, something that Lindiwa said earlier today, which was the fact that there's only 12, I think 12 main crops and four animal species that are mainly eaten. And um, I've come to learn, I'm, I'm president of the Salk Institute where they study plant pathways. And I've come to learn the extraordinary under use we make of all of the nutrition, nutrient rich ways plants, they just, They've, they've done it all for us. Naturally, <clears throat> plants have produced incredibly diverse nutritional possibilities. We exploit a very tiny fraction of them very inadequately for nutritional optimization. And this is not science fiction. It's actually very well understood now. That and also sustainability. 
So why do we eat what we eat when we know it has such poor um, issues in terms of sustainability? It's now quite well understood. The pathways in plants, the gene networks, since you asked about genetics but not in plants, <laughs> but the gene networks in plants that they have evolved to deal with all the things we are wor worried about in the world, higher temperatures, unpredictable water patterns, higher salinity, um, you know, conditions of poor or extreme light and so forth. This is really not science fiction. So if there was a will to say, we need to actually think about what is it that's best for humanity, for plants. Plants have figured this out. Humans has, have gone a long way to figure this out and they are not using it. So I think there's very interesting things that once the word gets out, plants are really, really consummate chemists. They make their own pesticides really well, by the way. We don't need to, <laughs> to have external ones necessarily. So I think the science of what plants do is now with all the modern technologies of just understanding plant genetics is now much better understood. They really could solve these kinds of problems for us. And now it's up to us to say, that's what we, want to aspire to because it's all, it's all there. And, uh, and so the individual, I think, you know, when it comes to collective will and saying, you know, uh, the food movements we've heard talked about earlier today, to say, yeah, we, that's, that's the kind of thing we want to have. So maybe our biology is to say, we're very curious as well, and we've found out now what plants can do, and it's much, much more than is being currently used, or was even imagined perhaps 10 years ago. So there's lots of potential for new plant breeding and new development breeding, to yes. deliver mm -hmm. the sorts mm -hmm. of nutrients and nutrition that we need. But, yes. but and and to climate resistance too, that's another And resistance. Thing. But, yeah. but the fact is that in so many cultures across the world, the food that is most valued is meat. And there will be a, a more detailed session on it mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. But whether you're talking about working in, in Somalia, where perhaps um, where meat has a particular kind of status, or in Baltimore, or in Brazil, where meat is held in very high regard, it's there. It's central. And and how do you um, how do you shift that culture of, of 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 valuing those sorts of prime protein? Well, can I can I speak yeah. to that again? Biologically speaking, it's you know, shifts in behavior can happen gradually. And I think many of, you know, now in a privileged environment, many of my contemporaries just have shifted away from meat, but it's not like overnight. I think with education and, and having, you know, suitably satisfying other foods, that's the difference. I think meat was a, because other foods were not necessarily so satisfying. So I think that, uh, you know, outreach, education, um, people understanding that other foods are possible. And meat is not all to be demonized. There's ways that you'll hear no. about where you, you can actually quite sustainably grow meat in grass-fed environments, which are actually much more ecologically sustainable than the current ones that are being used. And, and that's not for me to talk in detail about. But I think that having great diversity in, in our food is to our benefit. And we really need to understand what optimal nutrition is for adults as well. That's very poorly understood. And I think that's a real challenge to aspire to as well. Just do you want yeah, to I mean, say I, a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the grand challenges of, of as economies grow, there's more appetite to consume animal source foods. And if you're thinking about the low income context, animal source foods are actually incredibly important in filling nutrient gaps for children under two. It's very hard to meet that on a local plant-based diet. Nutritionists know that. So it's in every right for a family to want to consume meat, particularly in low income countries or, or transitioning economies. We see this in China, right? We're seeing this huge appetite for animal source foods. The question is, is you know, you have high income countries like my country, the United States, uh, where you have a lot of meat consumption. And how do you get the United States in an ethical range where you're not becoming paternalistic? In America, we're all about self-liberties. We'll become more like that with our new president-elect. 
Mamma mia. But... <laughs> That's being kind. I, yeah. <laughs> when when Johan was speaking, I just... My, yeah, climate change is a hoax is going to be the new tagline for the United States. But anyway... Um, how do you, how do you, whose duties and obligations is it to try to get that meat consumption down? This is incredibly difficult. In some countries, you need to lift it up a bit to try to address some of the undernutrition that we're seeing. This is really complicated, and we get into issues of who controls our food environment, who controls the food system, and whose roles and responsibilities is it to hold those accountable? This is the toughest part for us. We've got the food movement, that's wonderful, but where does the state come in? Where does the government come in? Where does civil society come in? How do we hold the private sector accountable? How do we hold citizens accountable? When you ask an American, maybe you should eat less meat. Like, don't tell me what to eat. Yeah. Now, I, the question we all have to ask ourselves is, do we have the right to eat wrongly at this point? Well, that's a good time to bring in you, Eduardo, because I've actually... <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I've actually got a question to you from the Twitter sphere, um, which is a question to Brazil. What, and this is the role of the state. What is the evaluation of the soda tax? Has it improved health or just the consumption of Coke? Well, uh, to this point, Brazil is still discussing the, the food... The beverage tax, but it has already been implemented in Mexico, for example, and as I think it's too short term to have a real impact on obesity, on diabetes, but they do have a reduction in the consumption of beverages, but not only uh, Coke or any other, but all sugared beverages, and that's very important. And that part of the revenue that uh, comes from taxes is actually used in schools for uh, water fountains. So you, you are creating mechanisms to replace that. And I think it won't happen in the short term, but it will uh, happen. But it's very important to address. I'd like to switch back to the first uh, the discussion. Is, uh, the key, I think, is uh, to address food and address the diversity that we sh should have in diets and also synergies, because nothing is random, even in foods, mm -hmm. but I, and also in meals. It all comes from a biological, evolutionary context all the, of this history, but also in, in terms of meals, because we have each culture that has subsided and has created these mechanisms, creating the, all of the meals and all the foods involved, and that, that brings near the nourishment that we need. So from Africa to South America to uh, the Northern Hemisphere, we also address that when we think of uh, healthy diets so we can work on supply and demand, but uh, medication walking by hand by hand, but having all the population involved, all of the stakeholders involved from governments to uh, other institutions. But also uh, remembering that there is a very important international momentum right now with a decade of nutrition uh, of the UN. So it is a really important moment for countries to get involved, but all of the stakeholders around the world to actually address nutrition um, as a priority for the population in terms of, and also the SDGs, of course, because we can take environment, health, and all of the other aspects uh, in one picture. So we've got 15 seconds to go, and it seems <laughs> I'm asking a big question for very little time. If, if there was one thing that you felt a government, perhaps not your government, could do um, to foster a shift towards healthier and more sustainable diets, what would it be? One in turn. Make uh, healthy foods fun to eat <laughs> and not punitive, you should do it. <laughs> Make healthy foods affordable. I, from the policy point of view, I think you have to have a whole set of actions that, uh, <laughs> that can make it fun, make it affordable, accessible, uh, and make it part of the real life. And so not going back into the past, but looking into the future, what we can build right now. Great. Well, thank you very much.